Good evening. Good to have you back with us in our summer series this Wednesday night. It has been a good summer series talking about home and family. We've had so many good lessons. I know it's been beneficial to each and every one. Uh, welcome. We're glad to have you with us tonight. A couple of things we need to mention concerning those in our prayer list. Uh, we have uh, Louise Rice, uh, the cousin of Glenda. We extend our sympathy to Glenda Pyle and her family and her passing. Uh, also to the family of Mike Schubert, a passing of his brother, Ronnie Schubert. Sandra Saunders has been diagnosed with cancer, and uh, she'll have a biopsy to determine what type of treatment they'll be doing, and that'll begin soon. Stacy Craig also is still having difficulty with her recovery and needs to be remembered in her prayers. Jeff Patterson, the husband of Sandy, is uh, not making improvement the way they hoped he would, and therefore they want to be remembered in their prayers. Uh, also, some of those who are not members, friends of our members, Joy Davis, L.J. Carter, uh, Deborah Maxey, are people that uh, are having procedures done and like to be remembered in our prayers as they recover. I want to remind you that Sunday morning we'll be going back to services here at the building, uh, 9 and 10.30 and 5 o'clock services. Uh, Lonnie Jones will be our speaker Sunday morning, and Tom Brandon will continue our study of 2 Timothy on Sunday night. So I want to remind you of those so you can come and be a part of that. Um, we want to remind you that if you need to get communion supplies, if you could not be with us Sunday, you need supplies that you need to come by the office and get those this week. Uh, the elders will not be available Friday evening because of uh, us having service at the building. So come by the office if you need to get communion supplies, if you need to drop off uh, your contribution. Uh, if you're wanting to mail in your contribution, you can continue to do that, P.O. Box 217, uh, to the attention of Greg Mathis. Um, our speaker tonight is a great friend of mine, Ron Williams. Uh, Ron and I come to this area not very much apart, just months. He's been there uh, as of uh, this week. He completed his 23rd year uh, with the church there at Lincoln. Uh, has been in this area, has spoke to us many times, no stranger to us. Uh, nor are his kids and grandkids and uh, all of those people we are very familiar with and glad to be associated with them. He holds degrees from Fried Hardeman University um, and also from Southern Christian University, has a master's in counseling there. Uh, he does a lot of grief workshops. Uh, he and his brother Don have co-authored a book, Walking with Those uh, Who Weep. Uh, so I think he is very, very well qualified to speak to us tonight. So glad he's taking the time to come and do it. Indeed, it's a privilege to be able to be with you this evening, even though it's virtually. Certainly appreciate this wonderful congregation in regard to what it has meant to, to us and to our family throughout the years. Appreciate those who serve as elders, some of whom I've known for many years, even at Lincoln. Certainly our association with Randy and Glenda and their entire family, we love and appreciate them and have known and loved them for many years. Of course, this is a congregation that is a family congregation. Ben and Haley, Reese and Emma, Gary and Donna, also Mary and Greg, so many other friends and loved ones. We appreciate you so very much and are grateful for this opportunity to be with you virtually this evening. A man was having a discussion with a friend of his. He said, last night was rough. We had a, my wife and I had a terrible argument. And the friend said, well, how, how did it end? He said, well, let's just put it this way. It ended with my wife on her hands and knees. Oh, what did she say? She said to me, come out from underneath that bed, you coward. You know, I have an idea that some men believe that their wives should remain on their hands and knees before them. And they quote Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22, submitting, wives submit to your husbands and all things as to the Lord. But as we want to study this evening, the rest of that passage, Ephesians 5, 22 to 29, tell us far more about the kind of husbands that we are to be to our wives 
than it ever says in regard to what wives are to be to their husbands. Let's read together. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to verse 29. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church's body and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any other such things, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. In a study conducted by Dr. Robert Blood and Dr. Donna Wolf of the University of Michigan, interviewing more than 900 American wives, They found that these wives said that they wanted companionship from their husbands even more than that of intimacy and or money. Almost all of them, including those without children, said that they had become increasingly less satisfied with their husband's companionship a decline that these specialists saw as being very corrosive. Dorothy Neville and Sandra D'Amico and their book, Human Relations, say of the husband, the personality and background of the husband, not the wife, were the important factors in the success of a marriage. These studies suggests that the husband is the key to a successful marriage. How he loves, how he communicates, how he treats his wife is the basis of whether or not that marriage will succeed. Solomon, a long time ago in Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 9, would tell us, live happily with the wife when you love, whom you love through the fleeting years of life. With the wife that God gives you, which is your best reward down here for all your earthly toil. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul addresses the kind of love that husbands are to have for their wives by a comparison of the great love, the greater love that Christ has for his church. While it's true that Paul does mention the submission of the wives to their husbands in the beginning of that passage, chapter 5 and verse 22, please notice that the entire content of the passage and the context of the passage has to do with the kind of husband a man needs to be for his wife. The point that Paul is making is that God expects the husband to be the spiritual leader both for his wife, for himself, and for the family. Within this text, Paul gives some six characteristics of a spiritual leader that a husband needs to be for his wife and for his family. The first point that Paul makes is that the husband is to be the savior of his wife. Verse 23. Now, obviously, we wonder, how in the world could a man be a savior to his wife? We know Jesus Christ takes care of that, spiritually speaking. But the word savior also carries with it the idea of one who provides for another. When we think about the protection that Jesus Christ gives us in regard to from the power of sin and unrighteousness. We, we know that 
He protects us. Therefore, what kind of protection can a man give to his wife? Certainly we understand that most of us as men think about being the provider of the home for our family. With our wives putting a roof over their heads, with our wives putting food on the table, with our wives putting clothes on, on their backs, and on and on we go. And certainly these are ways of protecting and providing for our wives and family. But I think there are some other ways that oftentimes we may forget when it comes to this kind of protection and providing for our mate as we should. There are times when a husband needs to provide emotional protection, to be a support, to be an encourager, to, to be a resource of help, not just to the wives, not just to our own children, but to her side of the family and to other family members as well, trying to help them as they face the problems of life that we all face. You know, when our wives, if they work away from home, come, day, come back after a bad day at the office, they don't need advice from us as to how they could better handle those relationships. Or, or at home with sick children, they don't need to be asked the question, what did you do all your day off? Forbid that we would even ask such a question they need tender loving care. They need emotional support. They need someone that is providing for them what they need at that point in time. And just as Christ provides for His church, so the husband needs to provide and be that savior for his wife. But secondly, Paul says, verse 25, that we are to love our wives. I'd like to take that word love and, and substitute the word value there. What Paul is saying is if you love someone, you value them. You, you consider them to be important. You, you consider them to be, to be of utmost consideration. And what Paul is saying is that as husbands, we are to place a very special value and importance on that marriage partner, unlike that we have a relationship with anybody else in the entire world. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, wrote about the problems, the solution to the problems that the church at Corinth had. He was writing to a church that was severely divided. Leadership, doctrinal issues, worship in regard to what one did at worship on, on the Lord's Day, spiritual gifts, problems with immoralities, yes, problems even with marriage, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And even though all these brethren possessed special spiritual gifts, they did not possess a spirit of loving and caring for one another. Thus Paul says, chapter 12, yet I show you, verse 31, a more excellent way. And then he began to describe what love really is. Love is patient and kind. Love does not boast and does not envy. Love is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails. Or as another translation says, love never ends. Paul, what are you saying to the church at Corinth? This is the solution. This is how you show value to one another. And if we can take that, con that context and make it apply to the husband-wife relationship, 
That's exactly what we're to do. We are to value our wives. We are to show them in our leadership roles and our models that they are tremendously important. There, there's no one else more important to them. This idea of dictating, this idea of being the, the man of the house and ruling with, a, with, a, with an iron fit, you can't find that in Scripture. You can't find that as a husband that is to love his wife in the very same way that Christ loved his church. A third thing that Paul mentions is also found in verse 25. That the husband is to give himself to the church, to his wife, as Christ did for the church. You know, usually when we think about leadership, we don't think about self-sacrifice. We think about someone being a leader making de decisions, someone leading and guiding. We think someone that's in charge, someone in command. We think of someone with a strong mind that, that sees the problems and, and takes care of those problems and then goes forth. <coughs> but you know, while those may be qualities of decent leadership, the quality of unselfishness, even to the point of self-sacrifice, becomes one of the major ingredients for the greatness in the eyes of God. I'm sure in this congregation, just like my congregation at Lincoln, most of the individuals who attend are members of the church. Let me ask you a question. Why are you a Christian? Or did someone force you to become one? Did someone make you come to church services? Obviously, you're a child of God because you decided to follow Jesus. Somewhere in your life, you came face to face with the reality, with the reality that God loved you so much that He sent His Son to die for you. And because you were so drawn to that love of understanding that Christ died for you, and yes, for the whole world as well, that's why you follow Him. Our Lord became the greatest leader in all the world because of His sacrifice for other individuals. In World War II, General George Patton was the most brilliant field strategist that this country had ever known to that point in time. He was not a perfect man. He had faults and mistakes in his life. But, but when it came to commanding men, particularly in desperate situations, he was the best of the best. During World War II, Dwight Eisenhower gave him the command to move the entire Third Army from Southern Europe to Northern Europe to get ready to fight against well-fortified and well-maintained German soldiers in what would be the push into Berlin called the Battle of the Bulge. In order for Patton to accomplish that great feat, he had to move the greatest number of troops, the largest amount of equipment, <coughs> the greatest distance, in the most poss impossible of conditions, the middle of winter, that had ever been heard about in the history of the world. In a period of 72 hours, <coughs> he virtually moved his entire army, or army from the, the southern part of Europe to the northern part of Europe toward Berlin without any kind of sleep, with hardly any food, in the midst of winter, ready when they got to the front lines to fight against well-fortified and well-trained German soldiers, to go immediately into battle 
and to defeat, and then defeated the Germans there at the Battle of the Bulge. After the battle had been won, reporters came to him and wanted that and asked the question, how did you accomplish this? How in the world could you do all the things that you did in just three days' time? And some of you may recall those newsreels of showing General Patton standing there in the middle of the road as all the soldiers were marching during those 72 hours. And he was standing there in the mud, shaking hands, encouraging, speaking to them, patting them on the back, letting them know that he appreciated the sacrifice that they were making. He told those reporters, my men fight for me because they know that I never ask them to do anything unless I first have agreed to do it myself. You see, during those 72 hours, he was in a tank along with his men as they made that trek from Southern Europe to Northern Europe. Sacrificial leadership. He understood the power of motivation to get people to do things by first doing it himself. That is exactly what Paul here had in mind when he said, Husbands, you serve your wives. And I think also our children. You be the spiritual leader by doing first what needs to be done so that they can and will follow you willingly without any question at all. They will, wives will willingly submit to their husbands as those husbands are submitting first and foremost always to the Lord and doing the best for them. You serve your mate. The, first, the fourth thing that Paul mentions in this text is found in verse 26, where he says that the husband is to sanctify his wife, as Christ did for the church. Now the word sanctify means to set something apart. It means to make something special or to make it different from other things. It's a word that typically we do not use except in regard to religious connotations. In the Old Testament, they would sanctify the tabernacle so that it would be worthy to be able to, be worship, to have worship therein. And then later on, when, when the temple was built, they had a great sanctification service in which they did all kinds of sacrifices, all kinds of wonderful things <coughs> to show that this was a special place where God was worshipped, and it was set apart for that kind of thing. In the same way, we are to sanctify our wives. What does that mean? It is to be unmistakable to our, in, in her mind and to others that know me in my life that my wife is special without anyone else close to her in any kind of way. That she really is set apart from the rest in regard to my love and my respect for her. She's not something that I take down every now and then and clean and polish like that of a trophy or, or a special gun. She is a living being made in the image of God equal to me in that regard, and I treat her that way. You know, if, if wives were sanctified more by their husbands, I know we would have less divorce than we have in the, in the Lord's church today. But we would also have better and richer in relationships with our mates and yes, also with our children. Some years ago, I heard of a Christian counselor that was counseling, premarital counseling a couple. They were in their 30s, never been married before. The, 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 way, the lady, the bride-to-be had, had 
been out on her own and, and had lived by herself for a period of years. The husband was 34 years old and had always lived with mama. And the bride-to-be was a little bit concerned about that. So I got married. About a month later on, after they had been married, this Christian counselor had ran into this new bride at the grocery store. The bride explained that her mother-in-law was coming to visit them for the very first time and she wanted everything to be perfect and she was buying special food to prepare for their time together. The Christian counselor smiled and said, I want to hear about this later on. To which later on he did. The lady explained to her that, or the lady explained to the counselor later on that his mother, that her mother-in-law had showed up early and they had sat down and had a conversation together and it was about the time that her husband would come home from work. She heard the car door slam and as had been her practice, the, the bride explained, I would get up and I would go meet my husband at the door and we would kiss and then we would come in and visit and have supper together. And sure enough, when I heard my husband, the car door slam, I got up to go meet him. My mother-in-law, realizing what was about to happen, got up along with me as well. And thus, when my husband opened the door, there I was, and there was his mother. As she as was telling this narrative to the counselor, the counselor said to himself, oh, I hope he gets it right. I hope he doesn't mess this up. The man did not mess up. He walked in, gave his wife a kiss first, then reached over and gave his mother a kiss. And they came in and visited and had a wonderful time together the remainder of the weekend. Men, let me ask you a question. How different would it have been if he had kissed his mother first and his wife second? And some of you are thinking, oh, that's just a small thing. That's just a trivial thing. Maybe if they'd been married 30 years or something, maybe it was. But you see by his actions what he was saying to his wife and what he was saying to his mother. Mom, as much as I love and I respect you as my mom, my wife is sanctified in my heart, and she is first. That's what Paul was warning and reminding us as husbands to be in Ephesians chapter 5. The fifth thing that Paul mentions here is that the husband is to nourish his wife. Verse 29. The word nourish means the idea of feeding or supplying her needs. And in order for us to feed or to feed or to force to nourish or feed someone, we've got to know what the hunger is. Uh, imagine going to one of the great zoos here in America and you decided, okay, I'm, we're going to feed every, all the animals, the, the, the hundreds and hundreds of animals that are here, the different species, we're going to all feed them peanuts and bananas. You know and I know that most of those animals would die because they don't eat those things that would sustain them to be able to live. Emotionally, Physically, psychologically, and yes, even spiritually, if we love our wives as we should, we will feed them the things that will help them to grow as a spirit, as a person before God and before the world. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, Luke records for us that Jesus grew in four different ways. He increased in wisdom, that's intellect. 
He increased in statue, that's physical. He increased in favor with God, that's spiritual, and with man, socially. The word nourishes here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29, is only found in the New Testament here and again in chapter 6, verse 4, when he says that fathers are to bring up their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. What's Paul's point? Our job as husbands are not to dictate or rule our wives' lives and control their every move. Rather, we're to strive to help them to become all that they can be in a right and good way, both for ourselves and our relationships with them, with our children, and with the church as well. Just as a mom feeds that baby and brings it up to adulthood, we are to feed our wives and help them to enjoy the fullness of being God's woman in this world. The sixth and final thing that Paul mentions here again in verse 29 is that husbands are to cherish their wives even as the Lord does His church. What's the word church, uh, cherish mean? Mr. Webster says cherish means to hold dear, to keep or to cultivate with care and affection, to show affection for. Paul, what are you saying? We cherish something that has meaning to us, that has purpose to us, that gives us direction. The, the same thing as the idea here. Our chief goal as husbands are to keep our wives and our families safe and secure and cherished. We've warned our boys that one of these days, when and if we're gone, they will find a shoebox full, in fact, there's probably two of them, that have letters that they may think, I didn't know mom and dad ever felt this way about, them, about each other, but there, there are cherished letters that we had growing up together, having known one another, growing up the same congregation, being familiar with her family, dating about five and a half years before we got married, now about 47 total years together. Cherish letters. And I hope when they read those words before they throw them all away, they will say, what a love mom and dad had for each other. Years ago, many of us were privileged to attend the Burkine Faulkner workshops. If you, I think about a year or so ago, Brother Burkine died. I think Brother Faulkner is still living. But during one of those sessions, when particularly they were talking about husbands, they would have all the husbands in the audience to turn to their wives with them, hold their hands, and then say these words with them face to face, eyeball to eyeball. Other than Jesus Christ, I need you more than anything else in this world. And with your help, I will become a better man. I would hope and I would pray that that will be our goal and that will be our statement, at least by the way we live our life. That we will become better husbands so that we can and will benefit from better wives, not because of them, but because of what we have done toward them. Some years ago, Brother Dylan and Sister Patty Bays from Talladega, Alabama, entered a contest that the good housekeeping was giving. It was called the, the Happy Marriage Contest to which they were to, to, in 50 words or less, describe their happy marriage. Brother and Sister Bays won four, first place out of 12,000 entries 
in June 1996, their first place entry was published. This is what they wrote together. We gave when we wanted to receive. We served when we wanted to feast. We shared when we wanted to keep. We listened when we wanted to talk. We submitted when we wanted to reign. We forgave when we wanted to remember. We stayed when we wanted to leave. May God help every one of us to have the kind of godly marriage relationship that God not only wants, desires, but even commands, and particularly we as husbands, to do our part in loving and cherishing our wives. It has been a pleasure to be with you this evening. Thank you, Ron. What a powerful lesson on the home, fathers, husbands, our, our place. That's very powerful. Thank you. We appreciate your being with us, being part of this. I know you all appreciate this, I have, and you look forward to next Wednesday evening. Uh, our lesson's a little bit different next Wednesday evening. David O'Connell from the Oliver Church over in Rogersville will be speaking on We Be Brethren. So it's a little bit different lesson, but I assure you'll enjoy that. And I hope you'll be with us next Wednesday for that. Um, hope you'll be back Sunday morning here, present, if you at all can be. Uh, glad to have you with us tonight. Let's close now with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful for the opportunity to hear another lesson from your word. Pray, Father, you help us to be better husbands. Help us, Father, to have better homes. Help us, Father, to be pleasing to you in all that we do. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen.